culture, hit subscribe and make sure to hit the bell icon. And if you're interested in helping keeping this channel alive and going, you can join our growing community at patreon.com slash the medicine shell. As a thank you to my patrons, patrons have access to the digital 13 moon Odinani calendar that our ancestors used with its four day week, 13 moons or months, and different rites and rituals throughout the year, as well as my digital library, which has close to 400 documents, ebooks, articles, journals, and other insights and studies, which I use for my own research. All of this is available at patreon.com slash the medicine shell. And for those who are interested in learning how to pray the way our ancestors did, and specifically in the Igbo language, I've published a very short, easy to follow step-by-step -step booklet on how to perform Igolfo. Igolfo is important in family protection, spiritual cleansing, serving and receiving justice and success. And I understand that everybody doesn't speak Igbo. So I've included a pronunciation guide as well as translations from English to Igbo for every phrase. This is available at patreon.com slash the medicine shell at all tiers. And with that being said, let's begin. This video is going to be a little different because I'm going to walk you through how I got this knowledge. I did a video a while back on more. And to summarize, I didn't walk out of the research process the same person. And this is the analogy that I thought up to um, describe how I came to realize what I came to realize. Now, the reason I want to walk you through my own process is because after the information was given to me, I barely believed it because of the uh, level of complexity. And then this happened. Okay, so I grew up as a huge fan of uh, Dragon Ball Z, like a fanatic. And there was one episode where Piccolo was fighting uh, Android, I think 17. And I always liked Piccolo because he fought smart, so his moves were like something off of an Anv1 mixtape. But in researching, I spoke to an Nze, and what ended up happening to me days after the conversation felt exactly like this scene from Dragon Ball Z that I'm about to describe. So does anybody remember the fight between Piccolo and Android 17, where Piccolo shoots like hundreds of energy balls at Android 17? And they all miss because, you know, 17 is fast and significantly stronger than Piccolo. I think anyways. Then the android says something really cocky and the camera pans out and each of those balls were just kind of sitting in the air behind the android. And then Piccolo closes his hands together and all the balls come crashing down on the android, which showed that it was Piccolo's plan the whole time. Well, this is exactly what happened to my brain <laughs> when I was taught what I'm about to share with you. This is Derek Wolfardingwa with The Medicine Shell, and today I'm going to discuss the seven layers of more perspective that was shared to me by a very knowledgeable teacher, which at first I didn't really fully believe, then things started happening that made it impossible for me to doubt. Now, with the knowledge I was blessed with, I came to realize that I had gotten a hold of one of the most enlightening and powerful perspectives our ancestors had to offer. The perspective not only gave me a level of understanding to the depth of Odinani Ndibo that I was not aware of, but also to the depth and interconnectivity of many spiritual traditions you see around the world. In this video, I'm going to share what a halo is, why angels are depicted having them, what wings truly mean when we see them in spirituality and religious art, and most importantly, how the thing we call spirit or more has seven layers, each of them having its own very specific function that makes us who we are, and how understanding each seven will give us a new lens that we can use to understand ourselves and the people around us. According to Odinani Ndibo, and most specifically this Inze, the human spirit has seven spheres, which I'll refer to in this video as spheres, layers, or seven rings. Each of these spheres has a purpose and a power, a function onto itself that gives it a specific nature. And when all things are put together, it makes the whole of us or allows us to see what is unseen about ourselves layer by layer. Many of these layers manifest and have effects on the physical level. And most, if not all, dictate who we are as people, our personalities, inclinations, power, path, and purpose. In understanding the seven layers, I saw insights into the ancestral perspective on things like twinning, the human reflection, what we commonly call halos, as well as what most of us today know as chakras. Now, typically I don't do cross-culture comparisons on these types of videos because I don't really think it's all that necessary. 
but I'm going to give it as it was taught to me. So that will be happening in this video. But if you are interested in cross culture or uh, culture comparison videos, such as taking a concept in Odinati and comparing it to something uh, said or seen elsewhere in another culture, uh, comment below. The story begins with me researching for my video, Moi Explained, which I have linked below. Every human being manifests into the material world in two forms, as Madu, the material sentient person, and Mo, the immaterial sentient self. Madu, the you that is seen and felt, and Mo, the unseen, though also felt self. And together, the two function as your celestial left and right side, or left and right feet, by which you use to walk through existence. Mo manifests as your light, or aura body, an outward shining of your essence, that are to you what the rays of the sun are to the sun. And I will return to this analogy later because it is loaded with a lot of ancestral perspective that isn't immediately obvious. Both Madu and Mo function as a left and right hand, two mirror halves that come together to make the whole of you, but are incomplete without each other. Now we as people are fully aware that Madu has parts, be it the brain, the heart, the lungs, legs, and so forth. Particularly mysterious in the ancestral perspective is the fact that our ancestors also mapped out the anatomy, or more accurately, the ontology, of Mo, the immaterial, auraic self, and what each part of the aura or spirit does in the greater light body. What each part adds to your essence as a person and how some of those parts allow you to transcend to a you that is greater than you or a you that is greater than reality. And in this mapping, we learn what consciousness is, where it comes from, how it travels through time and space, and why it reaches us as human beings in the unique way that it does. In Odinat Indibo, the patterns of the universe repeat themselves through time and space, meaning that creation is the result of a finite set of patterns, which themselves stem from a single pattern, but repeat in an infinite array of patterns. Therefore, understanding the very simple original pattern allows one to understand all other patterns thereafter, like how learning to count from one to 10 shows you the pattern necessary to understand how to count from 1 to 100 and 100 to 1 million. This pattern is the chi, the unmanifest conceiver, an immaterial spark or tide that begets from nothing, and eke, the material, time and space manifestation of the chi and the effect that that manifestation has on the rest of creation, void and matter, nothing and something, movement and stillness, light and dark, earth and sky, and as our ancestors called it, chineke, or God. One existing to allow the other to exist, but neither existing without the other. So my story with the Inze started when I was researching the concept of Mo, and Mo is a very difficult concept to study as things that are commonly discussed by Christians like chineke, chi, ekwensu, have an abundance of materials on them. But things that don't enter the um, Nigerian Christian imagination like agun, uto, ogungun, and to an extent Mo take a lot more digging. And in these cases, phone calls and sit down conversations with Dibias and Inzes are always key to bringing out the things that aren't readily available to, I guess, the masses. So when I was ready to learn about Mo, I called it Inze. And this Inze, in a very serious tone, told me to call him back at a very specific time. Now we have conversations all the time and um, that uh, request was very uh, unusual. Uh, so I chuckled a little bit to myself because my exact thoughts were, damn, all right. Um, because I figured whatever he was going to say, I would be able to retain just by hearing it, as had been the case before, where our conversations were more uh, well, conversational. But this one was not about to be a conversation, as I came to find out in the middle of Kroger. Now prior to this point, I had the understanding of more as akin to a tide, meaning that when you drop a pebble into still water, part of its more is the rippling of the impact, or the energy it sends in all directions, which manifest as ripples, but are actually repetitions of that single impact from the original source point. More is the essence that radiates from you, similar to the rays of the sun and how they allow us to feel the essence of the sun from 93 million miles away. In ancestral cosmology, the sun is referred to as Anyangu, the sun, and Abara, its effect, the essence which casts in all directions from its source point, the rays of the sun. The meaning of Abara can be deduced from the etymology of the word, A, Ba, A, 
ma meaning to spark something into action most specifically to commit an idea or an object to the action it exists to do so if a person says iba ball and the ball is a basketball the person has said to play basketball with iwe being a gun iwe becomes to shoot a gun also meaning run and then iba also meaning to run and then comes the suffix ara to do something as a process or in perpetuity so for example with the pebble causing a circular impact on still water, the ripples of the pebble perpetually repeat the impact of the contact, forever casting the effect of the impact into time and space until it withers away. Meaning the impact is a chi or a source spark, and the effect that comes thereafter is the abara, the thing that the source spark causes to happen in time and space. The unseen power of the source spark moving from its beginning point until its end down its path in time and space. And therefore, in Odinani Indibo, when an individual is contacting the abara of the earth, this is the power an individual is communicating or tapping into. And as all things are repetitions of the chi and eke pattern or the seen and unseen seen. The abara is the more equivalent of the madu elements that it represents. Though the term abara is specifically reserved for elements of nature or things that supersede humanity in age. Now in the course of the conversation I came to find that this is more or less baby talk compared to what was about to be dropped on my head. Now later that night I'm at a grocery store with my son. And something drove me to check my phone, and I saw that it was exactly the time that Inze had requested for me to speak to him. And therefore, I did it. I reached out to him, and once he picked up, I realized something was very, very different in his tone. His voice, everything was entirely different. Now, one of the things this person had told me in the past was that in his training to become a Dibia, he was taught what he knows in a state of trance known as Igon Mo. Igon Mo is the process of submerging one's consciousness in the space of Mo as opposed to our human default of functioning primarily in the space of Mado. Igon Mo is a state of trance and a space by which an individual can communicate through and with Mo with things and forces inaccessible to the terrestrial human observation and mind. One can perform Igon Mo and tap into a line of communication with anything that has a Mo, such as a tree or an individual or even the dead. Famously, the Atulogo dance was revealed to the people of Umunze by a man who climbed to the top of a tree and performed Igon Mo until he reached Ubiosisi the heart or source space of the tree that he was linking himself to through the space of Mo. By tapping into this tree through Ego Mo, the tree revealed to him its dance, a dance by which a single person can possess the strength of many and the balance by which the tree uses to hold itself up. The ability to enter the space of Mo through Ego Mo is how many of our ancestors uncovered the medicines, technologies, music, insights, patterns, and even languages or language components that we enjoy today. Ego Mo can be performed with the living and unliving, and through trance, an individual can allow the Mo of a person from the past to possess them or to possess the subject of the trance. This is one of the many art forms preserved in the masquerade tradition, as individuals in a community identify specific spirits, and through the performance of Ego Mo, allow those spirits to walk the earth through them, or sometimes through an inanimate vessel. And by the use of Ego Mo, an individual can contact a specific spirit and receive guidance from them or have a necessary conversation. Now, my, for my own personal deduction, this is very much what you see when an individual is doing what we now call method acting, where the actor identifies a spirit, and if they're skilled enough, they achieve a level of possession that blurs the line between the two. You also see this in military training as a form of Igon Mo, where the spirit of an individual is replaced by the spirit of the soldier. And many drugs and substances can also lead to possession by one spirit or another. So if you're interested in the video on Igor Mo, comment below and I'll put it up for a vote in the Patreon. Igor Mo is also a key component in traditional education, which leads me back to the story. Now, the individual I was speaking to, like many Dibias, was trained in the space of Mo, meaning that their training was not given through oral instruction alone person to person the way a student is taught by a teacher today but instead in the space of spirit a skilled dibia is said to be able to enter the dreams of their students tap into more when they are in a meditative state and communicate lessons on how to practice the arts very often the student will also perform this with ago the abara of wisdom who then becomes their teacher and life guide as the two-headed patron of healers Dibias and those with spiritual gifts. If you're interested in knowing more about Agon, I've made a video called Agon Explained. 
and the link is in the description. Being able to access the space of Mo also gives an individual access to the gift of Eikili or astral travel, where an individual's consciousness takes on an astral body and moves through real time and physical space while being attached to the source or the individual performing Eikili by way of an astral rope that connects Maru and Mo, known as Eriago or Ete. Now remember this rope because it is very important in understanding what the Dibia or the Inze told me, which again is very important in understanding the full picture of what I'm about to share, as well as what was so strange about this particular conversation. And by the end of the video, you'll be able to see how. All right, back to the story. Now, I was at the grocery store with my son and the conversation started. Now, the Inze asked me if I had something to write with. And I said I can use my phone. And he said, all right, and began. Uh, now, again, we talk all the time and go back and forth on different subjects in Odinani and Debo. And I'm primarily learning when we're having these conversations, especially on topics pertaining to spirituality. So I already knew how the conversations went in the past. But this time, I felt that I wasn't talking to the person that I typically talk to. This particular version of the Inze was a little less humorous and uh, more intentional, uh, generally more calm, in a way that was a little unfamiliar. And as he spoke, I quickly realized why he said, bring a paper and pencil. And I heard everything a person could possibly hear about everything. From the reason vampires are depicted as not having reflection, to how zombies are created, to how vampires are created, which I'm not going to share because some of y'all are kind of wild. <laughs> and so the link between the formation of the human soul and the formation of a planet, why angels are depicted the way they are, why wings look the way they do, the spiritual power of blood plasma, egg yolk, the moon, why the moon sits where it sits, and how to tap into the elements of nature through ego mo. Now, in the process of this, not only did I forget half of the bags I paid for, I ended up scrambling for a pen and paper and really regret how arrogant I was when he initially said this. So I ended up just typing everything I was receiving to my wife's Facebook Messenger, which by the end of the video, you can probably imagine the uh, look she was giving me when I walked in the door, especially since I didn't come back with half of the groceries I intended to come with. Now, this is what the Inze told me about the seven layers of Mo, or the seven layers of the human spirit. The universe is comprised of two things, physical matter and the immeasurable unseen pieces of proto-matter that creates matter by condensing itself towards a single point or intention. And in order to condense, there must be a point of intention chosen by the chi of that intention. Now, prior to hearing this, I thought the point was the chi, but what I came to learn was that the chi is something that comes even before that point of intention. The chi is the sentient spark from which intention is created. The unmanifest awareness that makes itself a reality in the process we call creation, a divine nucleus which makes things exist through the actualization of its intention. These points or nuclei then cause the fabric of creation known as Ogoda Kamosu to condense at a specific point. So an intention is cast into time and space and the very fabric of time and space itself then condenses to the gravity of that intention until it becomes a physical form. So for example, my chi created me by way of a specific intention, which I can then call my purpose or akaraka. Once that intention was sent into time and space, things material and immaterial began to move until it condensed at a single point, which then created me. This point of intention or nuclei causes the fabric of creation or Agodokamosu to condense at its specific time and space. Agodokamosu is a cloth or a fabric that all things exist on top of, a matter blanket which covers the divine feminine Eke Komosu, or as she's often known, Nechuku, the Eke in the Chineke pattern, which is God. Nechuku is the universe, and all things in existence are made from a rearrangement of her fabric, or Okada, which gives way to the commands of Chuku's intention, giving new intentions physical form by accumulating previously existing material, or Okada, to a point of intentional density. But this fabric that things, material and immaterial, are created from actually shows that in Odinan Indibo, there's no separation between Madu and Mo. They are both the exact same thing. And believe it or not, they are both 
physical. When things condense, they form light, and from the condensation of their light, they take on a physical form, with their highest point of density being the point of intention. And as you move from the center, things become less and less dense, the fabric becoming less and less clustered until it reaches a point of looseness by which we no longer recognize it as a physical form, meaning that the matter, or ogodokomosu, which creates madu, is the exact same matter which creates mo. Madu ending where the five senses can perceive, and mo technically beginning after that, but only being different from madu in terms of density. It was broken down to me that the word mo is not even a word, but rather a sound whose root word is mo or mi, the o at the end serving as an exaggeration to stretch the word mo and in a way saying the big me or the full me. Mo also goes by the name of aka with the root verb ka in this context describing something that's bigger than another or in other terms an extension. So often aka gets translated as hand or arm, but is translated as so because what is being described is the fact that it extends the human being. The way akosisi or the branches of a tree extend the space the tree occupies. For this reason, aka is therefore used as spirit or mo or the full greater extended self in the Afa language. In the beginning, Chuku created the universe from this exact pattern an intention to create which gave shape to Ubi Chuku, a four-walled chamber at the source of creation. But this closed four-walled chamber was a vessel, and within that vessel rested the fundamental element of manifestation, Udi. Udi is still darkness, a darkness held by the mind, the womb, a whole egg or an unopened heart, and all living things. Udi symbolized an Afa by two dark nodes at the center contained by an outer shell of two light nodes at the end and the beginning is one of the fundamental elements in manifestation. For this reason, at many ancestral altars, you will see a regular feature of pots as the clay pot or rudu serves as a container for still darkness by which manifestation is made possible. With Akun Odi, Chuku nested unmanifest potential in Odi within Obi Chuku, which gave Chuku a point of focus for the intention that is creation. This then began the process of spiraling, which I describe in my video, Eke Explained. So if you're interested in knowing more about that, the link is below. But it is important to note that Ogorokamosu includes what is physically measurable, and concepts that are also abstract, as all things imaginable, tangible, and conceptual are included in creation. And therefore, the creation process, or the process of building from setting a point within OD, is similar to how we do things on an everyday as people in relation to the mind. For example, I want to write my name on a piece of paper. This intention is a pinpoint that I nest in OD, which is the darkness of my mind in the form of thought. This then creates a process described as spiraling. The spiraling of this intention takes form as the thought to commit the action comes alive within me. This wave like waves of the ocean animates tangible and abstract elements in the fabric of creation to move in its pattern. So I have the thought within OD. The thought becomes a rise of energy and desire to move. This desire then becomes the movement of my physical body. Physical body's movement then becomes a condensation of graphite wood, a piece of paper in my hands to a single point of creation, which again is a repetition of the original wave within Akunodi that we call the thought. Intangible elements or abstract elements also condense to this single point such as the Greek alphabet and the sounds they eventually make. All of these things come together and my name is given physical form. Now we can call this physical form or the writing of the name on the paper Madu, the densest form or the densest points of concentration that only require the five senses to detect. But when an individual reads that name, which itself is a condensed event, a sound rings loudly in their head and it says, Derek Duru of Fodorongwa. This intangible and unseen effect is the more. Both of these effects, Madu and more, complete each other. Of that name cannot be read or heard. The effect will never happen. And again, the intention never manifests. So for this reason, between Madu and Mo, no one is more you or more real than the other. Each of these two halves exist to make the other exist. The rays of the sun allow us to feel the essence of the sun because they are very literally the sun itself. 
the way your aka or arm is very literally you. The earth is the densest part of a larger complex, and the sky is significantly less dense aspect of the same creation. Now, according to the Inze, more forms in rings that radiate outside of Madu. And this is well illustrated with the planet Saturn, or how the rocks orbiting the planet Saturn form in a ring pattern to give sight or form to the ethereal body of Saturn itself. It is within the rings of the earth that the moon sits and therefore stays within its orbit. These rings manifest themselves in the human fingerprint, which is a part of your akaraka. And these etchings are a reading of the original intention that brought you, the human being, into creation. And therefore your akaraka is an encoding of your full spiritual body, as well as your destiny and what is to come as the pattern will repeat itself again and again until it fades. These waves, which radiate from the point of intention, are known as Ose. Ose is a wave, energy or potency, from the event that is a creation or creation itself. Often Ose, wherever seen in nature, can be used to ritually infuse potency, life and animation into all or medicine. For example, the rings of a tree stump can be used as a substitute for blood in Ichuaja or sacrifice in many cases, but not all. The external layer of egg yolk the same, as well as the plasma of blood, as they all point back to what the Afa language calls Ose. And as you are a series of waves radiating from the point of creation, or your chi, your mo is the same, though in a less dense form. And as you are designed this way, so is creation. And therefore, Chineke also has a spirit known as Ose Bluwa, tide which carries the universe, the way the Ose of the earth carries the moon. Saturn's Ose carries its rings, and that of the sun carries the solar system. The rings that Mo forms for a human being are seven in number. So, with this very long introduction out of the way, these are the seven rings of Mo. Layer number one is Aura, the non-sentient self-projection. The light from you which projects from you as a person, your Aura, is non-sentient, meaning that it does not think and feel, but projects what is thought and felt, or your essence, outwards, melding with the light of the things around you, and influencing the world around you with your essence. It is what allows for empathetic connection, what makes a spoon left in the sun warm, what is felt when a happy person enters a room and their feeling becomes infectious, or what pulls you down when you're in the presence of your negative friend. This non-sentient self-projection touches and affects the world, the way the aura of the things around you also affect you. Layer number two is Olili, the shadow. This is the non-sentient self-reflection, the aura being the essence that shines beyond you, the Olili being that which shines back to you. Now, according to the Inze who taught me this concept. This is the reason that vampires are depicted as not having a reflection and sometimes not having a shadow, as what is generally being communicated is that this is an essence without more. The lack of a more is also the reason they are depicted as being sensitive to the sun or being burnt by sunlight, as it is the more element of the earth or the sky and earth's general intangible field is what protects it from sunlight. And therefore, to depict a vampire as lacking more sensitivity to the sun is often used as a literary device. The Olili, or this part of more, is something that I've referred to in other videos as the self-observer, the you that looks back at you. For the planet Earth, the moon sits on this Ose, or ring, reflecting the essence of the Earth back to the Earth, and in doing so, giving the Earth life. This power is also seen in the fact that the moon is said to cause the tides of the ocean to animate. And as the self-observer, the phases of the moon affect the power of storms, as well as the moods of an individual, as one self-observer or reflects back upon you, has an extraordinary amount of influence over the tides and storms within yourself. It is important to note that Olili is a non-sentient shadow. And after I pass number five, you'll know why this is important. Layer number three is is Ibachi, or specifically Ibachi Kenga. This is the tide or ring 
that your life force sits in. This is the space that allows you to be a living thing. It also holds your seat of power, your Ikenga or your Omomo. The Ikenga is an individual's kinetic energy given to a person by their chi in order for them to actualize the purpose their chi created them for or be the person their chi created them to be. If, if one's chi brought them into the world to be a championship boxer, so long as that person boxes, they will have everything it takes to become a champion and will indeed become a champion. This extraordinary level of ability and divine capacity to do when you're in alignment with your chi is known as the ikenga. This is also coupled by the omomo or the omu. The omomo is your procreative manifesting energy, your ability to conceive both in the literal physical form of a child as well as in the abstract form, such as your ability to manifest your desires and wishes into the world. Omomo is also linked to your creative capacity, your ability to want to do something, or the connection between your desire to do something and that thing actually being done. The Ikenga is the seat of power for the masculine, while the Omomo is the seat of power for the feminine. It should also be noted that the number three is the number of the Ikenga in the Omomo, as well as the number of Amadioha, the kinetic force of Chuku's will, and Anna, the Omu holding force of creation, which is the earth herself. Both Amadioha and Anna are husband and wife and live in the third cosmic house, which is Afo, or the third market day in the Eke, Urie, Afo, and Ankwa four day Igbo calendar. Now I have a video on Ikenga, and I have a video on Omomo, and I also have a very recent video on the four market days. So the links are below if you are interested. Also, if you're interested in a video on Igbo numerology, I have great research on the topic. So whenever you're ready, comment below and I'll go ahead and start that video. Now, unlike the other layers, the Ibachi has its own seven rings within it. And in the third ring of those seven rings, there are seven more rings, which then have seven more rings at its own third ring. And this pattern repeats again and again into infinity. This dynamic is what allows a human being to have children and their children to have children and so forth. Meaning that one's procreative legacy has been mapped from the beginning until the end of time. And in having children or creating new generations, you're only unraveling what has already been planted into infinity. The Ibachi is a combination of two words, Iba and Chi. The Iba is a field that has been prepared for cultivation or a forest recently cleared for planting. For this reason, the third space of Mo is the Ibachi, the farmland or the cultivation space of your Chi. The fourth layer of Mo is known as Aro. Now I've spoken to my patrons about this concept and I've spoken about Aro in the seventh space. So my apologies if it gets a little confusing, but in the end I'll clarify why it's in both places. But in this pattern, what you'll find is that there are four original rings of Mo and after the fourth, they repeat themselves with a twist, with one and three being original. Four, or Aro, forming a membrane or a container. Five to seven being repetitions of one to three. But Aro also has its own repetition, which I'll elaborate on shortly. Aro is a ring around the other three, which keeps them one, keeping them intact. Aro is the space of self-awareness and intellect. This is where our wisdom accumulates and builds. Most specifically, the wisdom by which we operate in the world, or Ako. Aro is the conscious layer the sentient holder of self and wisdom, and is what is awakened or aligned with when an individual is enlightened. In Mediterranean cosmology, this aspect of self is depicted as a halo. Now, the Inze who shared this knowledge with me also said that what we call the crown chakra is also this Aro, and that the remaining chakras all exist within the Ibachi or the third space, with rings one and two being polarities of each other, Three and four are completions of each other. Three being the source of one's terrestrial or worldly power, and four being the space of one's immaterial unmanifest power, or four serving as the more of three in the Madu and more relationship. Three gives an individual what they need to actualize their cheese intent on a material level, and four giving you what you need to actualize it beyond. Now, once wisdom accumulates at four, it becomes Ako, worldly wisdom or intellect, the knowledge that you yourself own or piece together in the world. Layer four is also the layer of self-awareness, meaning that sensations within space one to four will feel like the self, while five to seven will feel like something beyond or out of body. Spaces one to four can also be referred to as Udi, 
It would be again being a space of manifestation, a still darkness in being. Now, one thing that I personally noticed was that if you look at space one, which is light, and space two, which is also another form of light, it mirrors the alpha symbol for OD, which is two lights on the outside, two darks on the inside. This is just something I noticed, and I don't know if it is something that aligns or was done deliberately. Now, as I said earlier, after space number four comes a repetition but with a twist. Akaodi is a light that omits from self, which carries one's essence. But Akaodi, unlike Aura, is sentient and aware, which records and contains all that is within the first four and beams it out into your surrounding reality. Akaodi serves very much as the hand or Aka of the Odi, the first four layers. Ako Odi also carries what it copies from the first four layers, or from self, and reincarnates it after death in the process of Iluwa, or reincarnation. Now, prior to this discussion with this Inze, I understood reincarnation to be something that your Onyowa, or your Agon, does, rather than your Mo. But after this conversation, I realized something, or something clicked. Now, I don't know if the Inze was subtly letting me know this, but it seems to me that layers one to four are what we traditionally refer to as Mo, whereas five to seven end up being what we refer to as Agon. Now, I'll give my reasons as I break down each layer, but it's one of the things that clicked that made me realize the power or the level of alignment that this knowledge had. Now, ring number five, or Akaodi, correlates with the phase Ise. After manifestation or prayer, you'll often hear the phrase Ise. Understanding that Akaodi, or layer number five, records and collects what is in Odi, the first four, then sends them into time and space deliberately. We'll give insight as to why Ise is used at the end of a manifestation, a prayer, or an agreement. Ise carries the message and makes it universal, casting whatever is wished upon in a prayer, or manifestation, or ritual into space to become reality. As the Aka Odi, ring number five is also connected to the palm of the hand or the Aka, as is represented by the five fingers. Ako Odi sends one's essence beyond that, as a capsule that weaves you through generations, reincarnating seven times before fading into the essence. This is the process known as Iluwa, or reincarnation. And if you're interested in knowing more about Iluwa, I have a link below to my video on the topic. Base number six, or the radiation layer. Now, at this point, I was scrambling to find a pen and I was holding groceries and my son. So in the process, I lost my opportunity to record the name he gave, but the one he consistently used was radiation. So we're gonna go with radiation, though I don't know the Igbo name for it. Space number six, or the radiation layer, is the parallel of Olili, space number two, or the shadow. As Ako Odi is a sentient light, or your sentient essence, casting itself into space, Radiation is the shadow double of self, which is also sentient, but sends your light back into you. This is the inner shadow which both looks back at you and speaks to you. Now, due to the Western way of seeing things, shadow usually translates as evil um, for most people. Now, I want to make it clear that Olili the shadow or the radiation layer is not inherently or necessarily bad. Blackness in the ancestral thought is something that looks within. Light looks without or projects outwards. Just wanted to make that clear before going forward. Now the radiation ring, according to our ancestors, is what allows twinning to happen. The splitting of a single essence into two independent but spiritually linked essences. Now according to our ancestors, Twins were the children of Anna, the earth, who is said to give to humanity in twos. Now, based on this knowledge, communities would have their different ways of dealing with the process of twinning. In some communities, twins would be dedicated to the community altar, to Anna, or become what we now call Usu, devotees to the shrine. And in other communities, twins would be separated from each other at birth their descendants being prevented from marrying each other for the rest of time. And in many communities, twins were left in a forest to be returned to the earth through death. I can do a video on the concept of twin burial, which is a nice way of saying infanticide of twins. It's a very controversial topic in Igbo history, or the history of the region we now refer to as Biafra. So if you're interested in that, comment below. The radiation space is what gives more its unique and timeless nature, meaning that wherever you go, this sentient copy of self leaves a double of you. Everything you touch, or even wherever your name or essence is invited, 
by being called, the radiation space appears. And if we were able to see this space with our eyes, we would see a timeless trail of copies or residue of your spiritual essence that is fixed in specific motions, moments, and feelings, trailing you as you move through life, similar to what you see in Edgerton photography. For this reason, when building ancestral altars, it becomes important to collect things that ancestors touched, soil that your ancestors walked on, or tokens to the activities your ancestors participated in, as their essence still lingers in the moment in time by which this thing was contacted or partaken in. Number seven is Ijite Eteaka. Ijite Eteaka is a rope tunnel of Ete, the strings by which creation is formed, which connects you to all things and is a source of creation itself. Ijite Ete Aka is what I referred to earlier when speaking about the sacred cord that connects your astral body to your regular body when your astral body is performing Ekili. Ijite Ete Aka is your strand of Ete, which is in the ancestral account, a network of unseen strings that connect all things, making the universe a single living body. These strings, or ete, are also described as roads, paths, tubes, or canals by which energy, wisdom, and life are transported from the beyond, or from one part of the universe to another. Ijite ete aka is an umbilical cord, a route from one space to another, which this particular inze referred to as the shaft of consciousness. This ring is sometimes referred to in metaphor as the rope that a palm wine tapper uses to ascend and descend up and down a shaft of palm. As ring number three, Ibachi, grounds you in creation and gives you what is necessary to do God's will in creation. Ijite Eteaka tethers you to what lies beyond creation, giving you what is necessary to do God's will beyond the terrestrial level. To symbolize this, the Ogene, which in Uli is the symbol of life, is a two-pronged bell used to lead a session of Ogene music, which itself is a ritual enactment of life. Each end of the Ogene bell represents Madu, and more, each playing to the side of creation by which it represents, but both representing the two legs by which the chi uses to walk through creation and connect it at the top by a string that makes them one. But every now and then another ring appears by way of Ijite Teaka. This additional piece is known as Uche or Abia. Abia is specifically wisdom or insight from the source of creation or the universe itself, which travels down Ijite Teaka and reaches the individual, allowing them to operate at a level of the divine. Abia is divine wisdom, parcels of God's wisdom given to an individual for a specific purpose, which has the nature of coming and going, but is never meant for or belongs fully to the receiver. From the word Abia, you get Dibia or Diabia, Di meaning master and Abia meaning divine inspiration or divine wisdom. It is important to note that a Dibia is more than a healer and in fact a healer is one type of Dibia which comes in many forms. A Dibia is an individual who is a vessel for Abia or wisdom from beyond, meaning that anyone that works with divine wisdom, no matter how it is applied, is a Dibia. This can be in science, medicine, sports, business, family, community work, bringing or seeking of universal justice, and any other human endeavor. Now, as I said earlier, Abia is not fixed, but rather it comes and goes, and is enveloped in a parcel known as Aro, which we remember from the fourth layer. Now, earlier I also said I didn't want to cause confusion because there is Aro at four and Aro at seven. Aro at four being an accumulation of intellect and wisdom known as Ako, whereas Aro at seven is where divine wisdom and intellect accumulates in the form of Abia. So I hope you're not lost at this point. But to keep it simple, the layers go one, two, three, Aro, one, two, three, Aro. Now, according to the Inze, Aro travels with two waves which project from it that he referred to as intellect and wisdom, or Akonuche. These two waves, or Ose, are depicted in the Mediterranean era as wings in many cultures across the world. And if you look at the pattern of a wing, specifically the type of wing that is used to depict this, what is truly being represented is the presence of waves. And without irony, God's messengers come down to the earth with both a halo and wings in many theological traditions. In Igbo culture, Aro is depicted by use of the Ichi marks. Ichi marks are adorned by individuals who have vowed to be living ancestors on earth. As a living ancestor, this individual becomes an Nze, 
And Nze is an individual who, due to their vow to be a living ancestor, lives by a very specific set of rules and stands in the place of ancestors in ritual or wherever is needed. Most universally, these rules include prohibitions against lying or being seen eating by non-Nze and dietary restrictions such as restrictions from eating fufu or cassava. Now I've done a video explaining what an Nze is called Nze Explained, so if you're interested, the link is below. Other symbols for this form of enlightenment that you'll often see in art, specifically masks, are X patterns or palm trees on the forehead, and often a mask which comprises of a large face at the bottom and a smaller face at top. And if there is no contrast between the two faces, oneness with the chi or enlightenment is what is being depicted. As this is a visual way of symbolizing the presence of Abya shining down from top to bottom. Now, if you're interested in a video on masks, comment below. There's a lot that I need to say on that. In Igbo art, Abya or arrow at seven is depicted by using the palm fond as well. The palm fond, like wings, represents Ose or the tides of divinity. Culturally, if an individual is walking from community to community carrying a palm, they're immune from paying tolls and taxes that used to be common on our ancestral roads. They cannot be attacked or harmed, and all doors are open to them as they are carrying a symbol that denotes them as a divine messenger. The carrying of the palm fond therefore represented an early form of diplomatic and travel immunity, as well as a loud way to communicate that one is a messenger carrying abya from one place to another. In the past, individuals who moved about with palm fonds were typically the Osu. The Osu were a group of ritual messengers connected to the Arushi of the land. As a part of their status, they were not to be harmed as they carried messages from Abara to people moving from community to community carrying palm to make individuals aware of their status. In the ancestral tradition, messages often went from Abara to Osu and from Osu to the individual, meaning the Osu would often be the ones who summoned you to the Abara if you were being called. The Aro, also like the Osu, were ritual experts who served as messengers and activators of the Arushi of the land. And like the Osu, Arrows were exempt from combat as well as being exempt from harm and harassment when traveling from community to community, which in the earlier eras made them somewhat of a human internet, moving messages from one community to another and from the beyond to the mundane. Another bearer of the palm fond as her symbol is Anyangwu, the messenger and representation of Chuku. We understand the chi by observing the sun, and Anyangwu is the Abara of the sun. As the chi is our personal sun, Anyangwu serves as the chi of the solar system and the most perfect representation of the chi that we can observe. Anyangwu is both a daughter and a world by which Chuku's representatives enter the world, such as Amadioha, who lives in the forehead of Anyangwu and represents Chuku's will, and Ekwensu, who is said to return to the sun after enforcing the will of Chuku, as well as Abala, the rays of the sun, which themselves are wisdom in near physical form. It is interesting to note that Abala also goes by the name of Abia, and from this we piece together one of Chuku's most popular names, Chuku Okike Abia, Chuku the creator who shines down on the land. Abia 1 in 7 gives an individual the mind of Chuku. It is with this mind that an individual can see future past and present can prophesize and receive messages from God or bring things into creation from divine light. So with Ijite Eteaka being layer seven, a nest for Abia to land, there are individuals who are rare among us, but do exist, who have Aro or Abia permanently fixed at seven, meaning it does not come and go, but it stays with them through their entire life as a part of who they are as a person. And I'll explain this shortly. Now, earlier I said that I have a hypothesis about Agon and that I believe that rings five to seven are what we refer to as Agon. And Abia is what Agon receives from Chuku, which makes their minds one. Now, if you've seen my Agon Explain video, you'll know the story of Agon, where Agon asks Chuku to know what Chuku knows. Chuku then says in order for Agon to know what Chuku knows, it must balance all of the other Abara on its head. Now, my primary thought on this is that it represents all of the elements of creation and beyond. And then the word balance representing the place of the wings in the movement of Aro 
or the Ose. Now, this theory of mine is also linked to the layer of Mor that conducts reincarnation, a role that is very specific to Agon or Onyowa within your own essence. But the final piece that made it all click is the story that I'm about to tell. Now, it's important to note that originally, a lot of this was above my level of belief. And I'm glad that I had the conversation with the Inze because after uh, my brain recovered from the battering, I began to see it everywhere or see the things that he was saying everywhere. A lot of the loose threads and the other things I had learned had come together. And rather than sharing what made it all click separately, I've kind of been in weaving it as I tell the story. Now, the last piece that made everything come together was I was having a conversation with another Dibia about the concept of Arobinago. Now, typically I have a rule that I don't present things on this channel if I can't confirm it in two independent places. So it's not a matter of asking another because I doubted one. This is just a routine. Now, the reason I'm being very specific as to who I got the information from this time is because I haven't officially confirmed some of these things elsewhere, but I've kind of relaxed on that rule a little bit because I've learned more and more that this isn't how spirituality or cosmology works. But what I learned about Aro Binagon shed a very important light on this topic. It was taught to me that in the past, it was very rare to find a person who could perform Afa. In fact, the reason a Dibya Afa is regarded as the most powerful or the highest rank of the Dibyas, especially in the past, was partly linked to how rare it was for a Dibiafa to emerge within a family or a community. Now, in my learning, it was taught to me that a Dibiafa can only emerge in a community at minimum 14 years after initiation, though it varies from place to place, and that while a Dibia is being initiated, a sacrifice is done on the very spot that the Dibia is initiated. From this exact spot, if they are a Dibiafa, an ugili tree will grow. After 14 years, the tree will reach maturation and its seeds will drop. And it is these seeds that a dibiafa will use to form their ugili by which they will do afa. By this time, the individual has been studying for about two decades under an experienced dibiafa. But the presence of this tree emerging after initiation is the invitation pass for the individual to begin training in afa meaning that if the tree does not grow, the Dibia would not be taught Afa. Now, this is the catch. The tree is not planted. You as a trainee will return to the spot to see if anything is growing. If a tree emerges, it is said that the arrow at seven or Abia is fixed in the person, meaning that it does not come and go, but it is a permanent part of their existence. In this person, it is said that the person then has an arrow Binago or an arrow which lives in his Ago, which manifests in the physical form as the Ugili tree. And that Ugili tree will grow where the person was initiated within their greater initiation forest. Now, prior I had understood Aro Binago to be the Abara of divination and forests. But once again, the greatest source of my own research, the uh, Igbo language itself, uh, kind of shined a light on this situation because just by looking at that name, Aro Binago, I was able to see that what the Nze was telling me and what the second Dibia were telling me fit together like a puzzle. And that's it. You know, when I first got this knowledge, like I said, I needed a while to process it. So if there's anything too dense in this particular video, um, don't feel alone. But I have a pretty smart audience, so I'm sure a lot of you guys uh, caught everything in the first go. If there are any topics that I brought up during this video that you want to see videos on, go ahead and comment below and I'll put it up for vote on the Patreon. That being said, I want to give a shout out to the patrons that make this channel possible. Adaku Utah, Hakachi Lam, Alicia Joyner, Amechi Ekufu, Amaka Adogo, Amala, Eamon Gabriel, Amenti, Sujai, Aniaya, Awonlukao, Madu Abuchi, Zachary, Awele Oka, Baba Imo Temp, BC Life, Cassie, Celeste Richmond, Center B Moon, Charles Williams, Chelsea E, Chika, Chike, Chimoge Ibe, Chinedu, Akunne, Chris Abani, Chukuma Bartholomew, Cozy, Didi, Dion, Temni, Ebuka Okoli, Emi Emi, Emeka, Enweruzo, Unisa Gwim, Jory Bryant, Simbodied LLC, Gerard Miller, Grace, Aiko Koye, Jada Renee, Kareem, Liz, Malachi Lee, Michael, Mikael Ounna, Netter Arts, Ungazi Onoha, Nina Marie, Nick Crenshaw, Nina Wafia, Unkwa, Namdi Uzuku, the Igbo Cyber Shrine, Obele Osisi, Ofuora, Olama Opara, Olise Meka Okapo, Princess Kaha, Ross Jones, Sarah Nwafo, Sharika Regina, Simon Julian, Stephen Chin, Tab, the Homegirl Healer, 
Tony, Trilla, Uchenna Campos, Urena Kara, and Victor Moloku. This is Derek Ofarawa with the Medicine Shell, and as always, thank you.